So hello everybody and welcome to this Brexit briefing from the BIA for March 2018. Uh, I'm Steve Bates, the CEO, uh, and uh, Laura Collister, our Brexit lead, joins me this afternoon. Uh, we're also joined uh, by a special guest, uh, Grant Castle of Covington, who uh, I think will be able to provide us some perspectives on uh, some questions I'm anticipating you may have on the detail of the transition uh, agreement. So uh, a big day uh, on Brexit today, and uh, we've been working right up to the last minute to make sure that we're bringing you the very latest. It feels like we're almost a new studio today with uh, so much going on in Brussels, and I hope we're able to synthesize this into a sensible amount for you. As you can see, we've gone away from our standard how many days to Brexit on the first screen, 371 days until uh, uh, until um, uh, the March uh, 2019 deadline, uh, because obviously we now have a transition agreement in place which will go uh, until the end of 2020. So we could be either 371 days till Brexit or 1,014 days to the end of transition, depending on your perspective, and I'll explain more as we go through. Uh, what I'm hoping we can do in this uh, half an hour or so together is give you an update on what's happened at the European Council today, uh, a flavour of a meeting happening at the European Medicines Agency with trade associations uh, this afternoon, uh, an update on uh, activity from the UK, what's going on in the EU, and what's going on at the BIA for some next steps for our sector. Uh, if you follow us regularly, you'll know that uh, we do these each month. They're available on YouTube at the link, link below, and this is what we uh, talked about last month. I imagine this is the, the stuff you're most interested in, the negotiations update, and uh, uh, things have moved apace. For those of you who followed our um, uh, webinars for a while, you'll remember that we put this up about uh, this this uh, slide from the BBC up um, uh, quite a while ago, and I think it's uh, indicative to see that we're just about through uh, to stage 2.2 of the of the long process of uh, uh, of Brexit, uh, even though this started many many months ago. And you'll remember how long we were in phase f the, the the first element of this. Uh, I think we are moving through. Uh, and there is some discussion of this, but not everything is uh, is agreed. So what's happened today? The European Council have agreed their draft transition agreement, that sets out the timetable for and a transition period, work from March 2019 to December 2020. Uh, it was agreed in uh, with the UK on Monday and the European Council agreed it this afternoon. And they've also adopted guidelines on the framework for the post-Brexit relationship discussions, i.e., how stage two of the negotiations should be handled, and we've seen those published today. So what's the key takeaways for uh, for industry from this? I think it means that a cliff edge Brexit is much less likely, although not uh, impossible, to happen next March, that the transition uh, agreement provides new certainty. It's a key political agreement, not yet a legal agreement, for the next thousand days or so. Um, the shape of the potential future relationship between the EU27 and the UK is becoming clearer, uh, although I wouldn't say by any means it is clear. Uh, but of course, as with all of these negotiations, wiggle room has been left uh, in, uh, in all of these uh, agreements. Nothing is fully agreed until it's all agreed. Uh, so uh, uh, no complete clarity on anything as of today, unfortunately. So the trans, uh, transition agreement, um, uh, this document was published uh, uh, earlier in the week. Uh, it's not a complete document. Uh, there are different color passages in the draft agreement as to which bits are agreed. They are in green uh, and some bits which are the proposals, which uh, are not yet uh, fully agreed, but they have agreed to work on it. And what then happens to this going forward? Well, uh, once it's fully agreed, it will become part of the legal text along with the withdrawal agreement, which was agreed back end of last year, then it has to go through the parliaments, European Parliament and the Westminster Parliament might happen by autumn, and then it becomes a legal document. So uh, some elements of this agreement require further discussion and agreement. The obvious one, if you follow Brexit, is the discussion around uh, the border of, between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and how that will operate and how that may continue to cooperate. And we've seen uh, that, that, uh, that the ambiguity in that recognised in the negotiating guidelines and Donald Tusk in his press comments today uh, said that that issue needed to be resolved by the June uh, Council, uh, EU Council. And because the 
politics of the UK and their ability to ratify this are linked closely to the agreement on Northern Ireland, given the close nature in the UK Parliament of the uh, of uh, of the UK Conservative government needing DUP support. I think it is quite important to understand um, <clears throat> the complexity here of the interaction between that part of the deal and the political ramifications of getting that through the UK Parliament. With regard to industry, um, I hope that the uh, <clears throat> uh, that what this means uh, is gives gives some some clarity for us. Um, I believe that under the transition agreement that's agreed, <clears throat> um, the UK is still on track to become a third country to the EU by March 2019. I don't believe that transition fundamentally changes that. What this does is this uh, has an agreement for what happens during the transition once the UK is, in a sense, out. <clears throat> and we need uh, and we are seeking further for clarification on exactly how key elements of this agreement apply to our uh, industry, particularly with relation to goods on the market, batch release, the European Medicines Agency and the MHRA relationship during transition. And uh, I mentioned that this afternoon uh, there is a, a key meeting between trade associations, uh, uh, European Trade Associations, Europa Bio on behalf of the BIA uh, and FPA and others uh, with the EMA uh, going on as we speak. Um, I think uh, the indications I'm getting from that meeting are that uh, EMA are sticking close to their uh, originally agreed position, which is uh, they're suggesting the company shouldn't rely on the transition period to enable them to, to think of their, uh, their business continuity. Um, that uh, the withdrawal agreement, as I've already said, needs to be ratified by the EU and the UK. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, I think that they are at present sticking very much by the public declarations that we've seen before them. Uh, we are asking detailed questions uh, of the EMA, even from the, the, the public doc documentations they've come up with already. Uh, and uh, I, I hope to be able to share that uh, with, um, uh, with members uh, uh, as, we get, uh, as we get a readout of that meeting, which hasn't yet completed. So perhaps next month we'll be able to share uh, more detail. And if there's a public document, we'll make sure that people are made aware of it. So, uh, digging a little into the, the, the draft transition agreement, I've mentioned that uh, there's three colours of text within this, this document. It's a, a document that deals only with the separation issues, the divorce issues, if you like, rather than future relationship. And it has got extensive clarification about movement of people, how trade and customs will work and IP protection will work. There's, of course, a good faith uh, agreement uh, in it, which is... Uh, which is important, which says that they, you know, everyone will work nicely together to carry out tasks that flow from this agreement. Uh, and there's a couple of pieces which, uh, given discussion that we've had in the past, uh, I think perhaps uh, uh, um, members will be most interested in. Um, there's some articles on goods on the market, uh, 36, 37, which are in the green bit, which means that they've been fully agreed, which talks about uh, uh, safety, testing and testing methods, packaging, marketing and labeling, uh, and uh, goods on the market. And uh, I'm delighted to say that <clears throat> in a minute, Grant is going to explain this to me because he is far more of an expert on this than me. But I think the important thing is goods on the market matters are there. And there is clarity in the transition agreement uh, with regards to regulation, uh, which is basically uh, that authorities of the United Kingdom shall not act as leading authority for risk assessments, examinations, approvals, and authorization procedures provided for in union law made applicable by this protocol. That's uh, agreed green text. text, And then there is some wording that um, uh, representatives and experts of the UK or experts designated by the UK may be able to attend meetings or parts of meetings if it makes sense for them to do so according to the text here. So I think that there is some clarity here both about uh, IP, goods on the market uh, and the direction of, uh, of um, uh, of travel with regard to uh, how the, the MHRA will engage with the EMA. Grant, I'm going to um, come to you uh, now. You've been kind enough to, to go into some detail on uh, placing of goods on the market, what it means, uh, and uh, some practical implications. So perhaps I can turn over to you uh, to help us understand placing on the market and what you think it means. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. So if you <clears throat> cast your mind back a couple of slides, uh, Steve had introduced Article 37 of the 
agreement that says that if a good is lawfully placed on the union market or the UK's market before the end of the transition period, then it may be further made available on the market of the union or the United Kingdom and circulate between those two markets until it reaches its end user. Now, the key words there are placing on the market because um, you have to understand that in order to work out exactly what this means. Now, unfortunately, uh, when you look at Article 36 that defines placing on the market, you'll see it defines it as the first making available of a good on the union or the UK market. And when you look at the definition of making available on the market, you see it defined as any supply of a good for distribution, consumption or use, which is further defined. So you need to cobble together uh, three definitions in order to uh, find out what placing on the market means. And when you do that, you get something like this color-coded mess, which um, is pretty, pretty impenetrable. Um, essentially, uh, when you cut through it, a product is placed on the market when it is made available for supply to the ultimate consumer or user. Um, it isn't actually necessary to supply it. It isn't necessary to introduce it into distribution channels so that it is in the hands of distributors. All that is required is that the entity placing the product on the market um, makes it available for supply so that, for example, um, a customer could place an order and product could be dispatched. It does not need to have been physically shipped. Um, and what does that mean um, in the pharmaceutical context? And I've also included a reference to medical devices on the next slide, please. Well, what it means is that during the transitional period, there should be continued free movement of authorized products that have been released by a qualified person at the facility of a manufacturer or importer responsible for batch release onto the EEA or UK market so that it is available for shipment in response to orders or under existing supply agreements. It wouldn't be necessary for the product to have been supplied to a wholesale distributor or a retail pharmacist or a hospital pharmacist. Now then um, you go down the list. What about investigational medicinal products? Well, that is, is, is a little bit less clear, but when you work through the clinical trials directive, the regulation, also uh, the parent EU uh, medicines rules, I think you'd reach the same conclusion uh, that it's where a product has been released by the QP of the manufacturer or import responsible for batch release to study sites. Gain wouldn't have needed to release them, but once to you know put ship them, but but once they're released, once they're available, they should be able to circulate to sites throughout the UK and the EU during the transitional period. Um, again, when you go back and look at the legislation, I think you'd reach the same conclusion for intermediate products released by the QP at one manufacturer uh, for further processing in another. Again, during the transitional period, QP should be able to release intermediates, um, active substances and the like for supply to other manufacturers for further processing, even if they have to cross the EU-UK border to do so. And I think you'd also reach the same conclusion for CE marked medical devices once they are available for supply once they've been released by the uh, medical device manufacturer's quality uh, system. Uh, so they're available to ship. They should be able to move freely within the UK and EU up to the end of the uh, transition, transition period. Um, so um, that's that. I think I'll hand back to Steve now, unless there are any questions. 
So yes, yeah, th thanks, Grant. And, and as I open up the, the, unusually I'm going to take questions at this point because we've dived into quite some detail here. And the reason why we've dived into quite, quite some detail is um, we've seen since Monday uh, many questions from BIA members on this particular point. So I thought it was worth making sure that we were able to have uh, Grant's expertise. Thank you, Grant, for, for joining us to, to cut through what is a, a dense set of, uh, of, of almost legal text. Uh, I realise it's only a political text at the moment, but um, to give us some understanding as to how we might might go with this. And, and, and Grant, thank you so much for, for making it understandable for those of us who have to operate in a uh, in a practical sense against what is a, a complex set of, uh, of data. Um, if there is any questions from anybody uh, coming in, um, we see, uh, do please type them in uh, uh, on this point. Uh, but I think because Grant, you've answered it very, made it very simple, I think people have got an understanding of the practical implications, uh, which is fantastic. So I think I will release you from questions at this point. If people have got anything else, um, we'll have a chance for some questions at the end. Uh, but thank you. Uh, Grant, that's been really, really helpful and it's fantastic to be able to provide uh, that level of uh, detail and thank you to BIA members who've engaged in the discussion uh, as to what this means uh, this week, which I think Grant has summarised uh, fantastically uh, for us uh, and I think will give us a good sense as to how we can operate going forward. So I'm going to turn now to uh, the other thing that was agreed today. So we've talked about the transition agreement and this was uh, the European Council uh, talking about their negotiation guidelines how they plan to negotiate the future arrangements between the EU and the, the, uh, and the, and the UK. And what they've, uh, they've done today, as I said, uh, they put out a document which says this is how we, we plan to, to, to approach those negotiations. You may remember last time round when they said this is how we plan to do the negotiations uh, around the, the divorce, the stage one and the, then the potential transition. Uh, there was a question from the UK government about whether they would agree to it or not. Um, We've yet to see the UK government's response to this uh, and whether they will agree to negotiate along these guidelines. But last time they adopted them pretty quickly without, uh, despite the, the, the some Brexiteers arguing that this would be a big row about how it was done. So um, assuming that the UK follows the position of agreeing to this, uh, I think uh, we should see this as a, as a shape as to how the negotiations may, may, uh, may proceed for the the coming months and the UK government uh, mood music as of the middle of the week as people came back from Brussels uh, uh, was uh, was that they were looking forward to getting on with it. So uh, it would be surprising, I think, to see them th to, to throw their hands up in horror at this at this process. But but who knows? Um, and I think from our perspective, the draft approach that's been suggested by the EU Council rules out a sector by sector approach, although it does make some specific mentions of, uh, of fisheries policy. So I think it's unlikely that we'll see uh, an early agreement with uh, a sector deal uh, uh, that would would work for, for our sector, which in some respects is a, is, is, is a shame because I think we could neatly do a deal around um, uh, much of the, the, the work that's, uh, that's evolved uh, in, a, in our sector. Um, we, however, do want to make sure that uh, medicines regulation is an early priority to ensure public health and patient safety. And I suppose we can see that this is now rushing towards either agreement uh, perhaps fantastically if it was to be done by June, but more realistically, I think, uh, by October this year. And those are the sort of the, the next points in the negotiation that may well they'll be there. Um, this is a very quick ri uh, rip out of the, the key bits of the guidelines adopted by the European Council and published uh, at lunchtime today. Um, I shan't look to go through all of it. Um, uh, I have a, a take on this a, a bit later that will come, but you can see that it's... Uh, uh, or readiness to work towards a free trade agreement, the aim be having zero tariffs in trading goods, uh, quantity, uh, few quantity restrictions with appropriate uh, accompanying rules of origin, customs cooperation, um, trying to make sure that there's a framework for voluntary regulatory cooperation, uh, access to public human markets, investments and protection of intellectual property rights, etc. This is available in detail uh, on the web. Um, and they are talking about uh, continuing cooperation in fields of research and innovation, making sure there isn't unfair competitive advantage through uh, a race to the bottom from the for the UK. So that's the sort of shape of it. Um, uh, and as I say, what does this mean for us? I, I think probably uh, our, our ask remains consistent as it has always been uh, that we want uh, 
aligned regulation, frictionless trade, ability for science and innovation to flourish and access to talent are the things that we need to be able to, to focus on. We will continue to, to advocate for those uh, as we understand the opportunities to do so in the framework that is put in front of us. And I've had a crack just before starting this, uh, this webinar, so what do I think all this means? Um, I think this is Steve's, uh, Steve's uh, summary of what's, where have we got to today. So uh, I think the EU have said that we've agreed you can leave on these terms and you can have a transition now you've agreed to pay your bills, stick to our rules and have no say. Now we can have a chat about future arrangements and as part of the future we can talk through voluntary regulatory cooperation, trading goods, zero tariffs, um, make sure we've sorted out rules of origin, appropriate customs cooperation, because you've explained the UK, uh, your red lines to us being uh, uh, no single union, uh, no single market, no customs union. But by the way, the backstop option for us on the most politically difficult bit for you, Northern Ireland, is to stay in the customs union and the single market, and we need to get this sorted out by the summer. And of course, they know that Theresa May's government depends, as I've said before, on um, uh, Democratic Unionist Party votes, which makes it quite a difficult one if we haven't got it sorted out. And of course, there's a backstop in the EU position, which is if the UK changes, changes its red lines, reconsiders the customs union, the single market, that they'd be happy to reconsider what they're negotiating about and talk again. And I'm sure that the EU27 are aware that the Labour opposition, uh, which have a significant voice in the UK Parliament, are um, uh, moving in the direction of <coughs> staying in the customs union. So I think that's where we're at uh, as we speak. Um, so uh, useful to see that the, the, the stage set out, but of course all of this is done against a political context um, which um, uh, can move on a weekly basis. You've heard quite enough from me at this stage, but um, I'm gonna hand over now to, to Laura to give an update on what else has happened uh, at the UK and EU levels in recent times. Laura. Um, so a quick UK and EU update. Um, firstly, I um, might have forgotten now is that the Prime Minister gave another speech. Um, this had a key thing in for us of that the UK would seek to remain part of EU agencies and she specifically stated the European Medicines Agency. She did then talk about it being associate membership um, but I think we're going to focus on the bit around remaining part of the EU agencies going forward and how we do that. She did accept that we need to abide by the rules and make a financial contribution. We also looked about the need for one series of approvals in one country um, and looked at sort of some of the legal um, parts that will be needed um, for this. Um, at the time, BIA put out a statement, Steve gave a statement, which is this, um, we said, which we broadly welcomed um, the EMA um, remaining in there. Um, as I run through some other things, some key points um, for, from here is that, as the Prime Minister was saying, remaining part of the EMA, regulatory cooperation is something we've talked about a lot and have been talking about since summer 2016, is actually um, something that basically runs through the whole UK and EU update. So there's some quite a lot of similar messages coming out from across the UK and EU from different organisations and different stakeholders. So John Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, said shortly after the Prime Minister's speech that um, the Labour Party would also look for close cooperation between the UK and the EU in medicines regulation as it's in the interest of patients both in the UK and the EU. He um, looked at, um, talked about um, some, good, some of the case studies that the Brexit Health Alliance had pulled together um, in their recent briefing and um, he also talked about continuing, wanting to continue to be part of um, the European Medicines Agency. Um, equally, the Health Select Committee um, this week published their report on, on Brexit and um, patients and their top thing was around um, ensuring um, looking for regulatory alignment again. Um, so they want to ensure that, that patients are safe and have access to the best public health protection. Um, this is, um, so this is again sort of key bits which a key common theme coming from everything and sort of saying that we start from total alignment on regulation and therefore we should be seeking it going forward. 
the Science and Technology Committee recently had their Brexit Science and Innovation Summit. Um, they talked about continuation um, in terms of Horizon 2020 and follow up with um, Framework Programme 9. Um, in terms of the EU, um, a number of patient groups, both from the EU, UK and the EU, came together and wrote to David Davis and Barnier um, looking at four key areas, including close cooperation on medicines regulation to ensure safety and access to new treatments. They also talked about the need for frictionless trade um, and clinical trials and a smooth transition. Um, equally um, also important, given that um, the withdrawal agreement and the implementation agreement need to pass through the European Parliament, is a res resolution that was um, strongly supported in the parliament and included um, a line around um, the need for continued and safe access for medicine to medicines for patients and medical devices for patients. So sort of right across all the different spectrums and from different stakeholders and organisations, there are some common themes coming through, um, which are in those areas that BIA has been advocating since probably about a month after the referendum result. Yeah, since members came together, and I think, Laura, it's testament to your hard work to see uh, some of the messaging that we've been working on for a very long period of time uh, reflected in um, uh, in, <clears throat> in outcomes that you're seeing both at the UK level, so the government, the parliament, the opposition all lined up around uh, our issues in a way that's helpful and supportive, and seeing that as a result of work with European colleagues uh, amongst the EU27, and I hope members can see that. The, the excellent job that Laura's done in working that up and uh, making sure that we've been able to, um, to to get our messages across effectively and then uh, out to, to a community. So I'm going to finish with, uh, before I take any more questions, um, uh, an update from the bit on the BIA and what we're doing. So uh, a month's time we'll do another webinar uh, and uh, we are uh, organising a, uh, a, a lead network meeting for uh, people in companies who lead on the Brexit issue for BIA with AB and ABPI members. Second of May in the morning, we're going to do an event uh, to have a discussion. We'll hopefully get an update from government, have a discussion on uh, things uh, face to face. Uh, so if you're interested, um, put that one in your diary and uh, it's on the BIA uh, website if you want to book on there. Uh, as I say, a month away for our next webinar. So continuing to discuss this uh, going forward. Um, what are we working on uh, on your behalf uh, in the next month? I think we'll, we'll continue to look at future trade policy. Um, there is discussion at the UK government level on free trade agreements and um, the transition agreement enables the UK to get on and discuss those with uh, countries around the world. So uh, I think we'll be uh, looking for expert input and engagement with those as the UK government starts to think about those. Um, there's been some talk about whether mutual recognition agreements or might be a way of, um, of providing some early clarity in elements of the uh, discussion between the UK and the EU. Uh, I don't think that's uh, landed yet as being the way forward, but I think uh, we'll continue to explore the potential for those uh, in the next period of time. Uh, migration and skills will continue to make the case for the sector as to the, the need for uh, access to talent as an absolutely crucial piece for uh, for member companies uh, and we'll engage with them in the Home Office on that and we'll continue to uh, work on uh, the detail of regulation and what it means both uh, at the point of Brexit and during the transition uh, period and what people need to do to make uh, make things work. Um, we're lucky to have uh, a meeting timetable with ministers uh, next Wednesday where I'll be able to update and get any uh, any 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 further information, further clarity on uh, on this week's events or where the UK government wants to go. We'll try and make sure that we have uh, even more detail along the lines that we've discussed today around um, uh, goods on the market, other areas, uh, if the EMA or the MHRA are going to uh, be more clear about how they're going to operate in the period until March, the period from March until the end of the transition or in the future period. Um, the BIA board uh, will take a look at the work that we're doing uh, in April and that may lead to some new prioritisation, but uh, I think that they're broadly uh, I think board members are broadly happy with the, the direction of travel, but it will be useful to have a look at it uh, sort of uh, almost two years in since we started this work. And I've already mentioned uh, the Brexit lead network as an important meeting in the first week of May. So where have we got to? And I hope we've done this in half an hour for you. Uh, 
pretty big day today for Brexit. The transition period to December 2020 broadly agreed and the framework for stage two uh, of the discussions proposed. We'll continue to help members understand what this means for, this, for their businesses to the best of our ability, despite being clear that not all of this is entirely clear. And we're continuing to argue for and will seek mechanisms to talk about regulatory cooperation, alignment, frictionless trade, movement of talent, and R&D collaboration and funding. And we'll continue to make the case that medicines regulation needs to be prioritised for phase two for the benefit of patients and public health. Of course, as you all know, in all of these agreements, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. I think at that point, I'm gonna open it up to see if there are any further questions from anybody on uh, anything at all um, uh, on these things. And I have got some detailed questions. So uh, Grant, I'm gonna see if you're able to come back in at this point. Uh, and do chip in if you feel able to uh, add a, a comment on any of these. Are, are you with us, Grant? Yes, I'm here. Great. So, uh, does the definition also apply to the upcoming medical device regulations? I'm unclear as to which which definition we're talking about, but I'm guessing that that's the one you shared with us, Grant. Does it co does it co cover upcoming medical device regulations? Yes. I mean, it covers it covers it. I mean, the concept of placing on the market is a concept that is prevalent throughout all EU laws governing goods. So whether it's um, electrical equipment, uh, medical devices, toys, uh, medicines, you, you have this concept of placing on the market and the concept of placing on the market will uh, continue to exist and apply under the medical devices regulation and the IVD regulation when they take effect in May 2020 and May 2022 respectively. The thing is, I suppose that that um, would have to do the just just work it out for the IVD regulation. That's likely to come into effect after the end of the transition period, but it will be relevant to the medical devices regulation from May 2020. Thank you. I think this is going to be another one for you, Grant, but um, bear with me. Does the practical implication of the interpretation on QP batch release, section 36, and placing on the market, section 37, mean that there will be no requirement for UK imports from EU member states already QP released to be recontrolled by a QP until the 1st of January 2021, e.g. at the end of the transition? I presume that this is a reciprocal agreement and there is no recontrol will be reapplied to UK exports released by a UK QP. Views? That, that's right, I think. So um, when you look at Article 37, it says that during the transitional period, uh, any good that's lawfully placed on the union market or the UK's market before the end of the transitional period, and that would be QP release in either the EEA uh, or the UK may be further made available on the market of the Union or the UK. So there won't be the need for additional import and QP release uh, as it crosses the EU UK border. Um, obviously, that that's without prejudice to. Um, you know, customs procedures, tariffs and taxes and things. But from a pure drug regulator perspective, that's correct. Until the end of the transition period, there won't be a need to import and re-release products cross-border. Thank you. I mean, I, I think as with all of these things, we are working on the basis of that which we can read. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, half the press in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of new stuff. and. And, uh, and what I've asked Grant to do today is try and help us all with a, from, from an understanding and a perspective of, uh, of the best knowledge that we've got at, at, at this time. And uh, I appreciate you for try, trying to do this, Grant. I realise that, um, uh, and uh, you know, this, is a, this isn't something where we are basing ourselves on, uh, you know, 50 years of case law and citing four precedents. Yeah, and, and it, it's, thank you very much for putting in place loyally style caveats that I should have put in place myself. <laughs> Unusual for it to be redoing that. <laughs> yeah. a, couple, a couple more here. Re regarding what uh, Grant said about QPs, does it mean that UK firms wanting to market products in the EU27 after Brexit 
won't need to set up a QP in an EU country during the transition period? Yeah, I mean, that, um, subject to all the caveats that Steve's already given, that, that's correct. Um, there won't need to be a re-release by a QP as, for example, products that has been released in the UK enters the EU. I mean, obviously, okay. subject to what happens and what is negotiated um, for the post-transition phase, it's you know there is a possibility and perhaps a likelihood that there will need to be QP release after the end of the transition period. I suppose there is possibility we might have a mutual recognition agreement whereby batch release would be recognised, but we don't know that yet. Yeah, no, and I think you can see this is one of those areas where potentially some some technical MRAs may make sense. And of course, at the same time as we're doing this webinar, there's a meeting at the EMA where the EMA are answering questions from trade associations. I imagine on some of these points. So apologies, we've sort of we're we uh, you know you you may also be getting information that comes from that meeting going forward. So I think I, I can see that there's some other thoughts here around this the the, the details here. I'm going to put them to you. Uh, Grant, but um, uh, I, I put my caveat around this, which is, you know, we are we are working in a corridor of uncertainty here, um, and uh, we are trying to help. But please don't, uh, 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 you know, um, I think you know we we have to put some parameters of of uh, this is our best work on the basis of a document that came out at the beginning of the week on this uh, to you. We're trying to be helpful, but um, but it can't be, uh, uh, you know, this is not, um, you know, this is not uh, tablets of stone. Um, uh, Grant, um, do you think that uh, the, the view that you're thinking, uh, the suggestion is here that uh, the EU thought goods did need to have been moved in the supply chain to have been placed on the market. Was there any discussion of that this week in the in the emails or or the discussions that you've had that you know that to, to be placed on the market to be into the supply chain? You sort of covered that, but um, was your was your your sentiment based on a, on a discussion of that particular point? Yeah, yeah. So, so there was discussion. I mean, you know, the term placing on the market is a key, a key uh, concept. Um, and when you when you read it at first blush, it it does suggest that products have been in some way marketed. They've been placed somewhere, and that leads you to think um, and assume that the product would need to be in distribution channels in order to be placed on the market. Um, when you get into the detail, and there's a load of guidance from the Commission on, on what placing on the market means, but when you look at the definition of placing on the market and you have to do this, this bit of a, a mishmash, you do see that you know, release into the supply chain would be placing on the market, um, but it doesn't need to be released into the supply chain. Um, it's enough, for example, for there to be an agreement, written or verbal, uh, between two entities for the transfer of ownership or property right or possession concerning the good in question. So if you enter into agreement to supply products that have been manufactured, then that's enough to place it on the market. And then the key language that that really you must focus on is the very last bit of text in this in the definition of supply of a good where it says um, that a supply of a good um, includes an offer to a legal or natural person or persons to conclude an agreement and what that means is if you have product that's been released by a QP and is available for um, a customer, whether that be a distributor or, or perhaps a hospital, uh, perhaps a clinical trial site to source. So it's not quarantined. So it's available for supply. That would, that would be enough to place something on the market. So there was quite a lot of discussion about this and, and, and what exactly it means. But I think when you work through it, it's clear that it doesn't need to actually enter the physical supply chain. It's enough for it to be available to to ship. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, and you're getting uh, you're getting hero messages here from those who are asking the the questions on this point. 
um, I think probably what I'm going to say is I think with this stuff, um, I will share the couple of other questions that have come in um, uh, with you, Grant, uh, uh, offline. I think what we'll look to do is to capture uh, the sentiment of this. And, and I hope what I can sh show to people is that um, Grant um, has got... Um, uh, 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 Grant's uh, uh, summary uh, uh, slide that he talked to at the beginning has got considerable thought behind it uh, and is the best that we've got to. Um, uh, uh, and we will look to make sure that this is uh, shared both through our expert networks. And I think uh, we'll come back to it again, both at the Brexit lead uh, uh, event and probably our next webinar, depending on how it's gone. Um, Final comment here from someone says, uh, someone suggests we need to read, consider closely with Annex 16. There is a distinction between QP quality release and QP certification. Step one and release to saleable stock. Step two. Grant, did you go through that one whilst, uh, or do you have a comment on that comment? Um, well, I think, I think, uh, I mean, I think the, 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 I mean, there are, there is, and obviously, there's, there are a whole load of things that, that a QP can do. And, um, you know, for example, with investigational drug, there's a, there's a question whether a QP in the EU can um, certify uh, and make available for release product that hasn't even entered the EU. Um, but I think, I think the, the key here is that is that you have to have product in either the UK or the EU that is available, that has been released by a QP um, and is available for supply to a consumer or user. So I, I think you, you know, just if I'm understanding the question correctly, you know, a QP must certify as he or she is looking at product that is ready for release, that the product has been manufactured in accordance with GMP and with the relevant specifications, either the specifications in the marketing authorization, if it's a marketed drug, or the specifications in the investigation medicinal product dossier, if it's an investigational drug. Once it's, it's certified, once the QP is certified to that effect, it can or oh, sorry, it's going to see it. He or she can release it um, until it's it's released. I suppose it could be quarantined, and when it's quarantined, it's not available for supply. But once it's it's been released and has been um, made available for supply, perhaps it's it's been included in a company's um, sort of order processing system, so that someone can place an order and the product can be shipped then that's when it's placed on the market i don't know whether that's helpful i think that's helpful i think i think i get the i get the I mean, so my my basic view on this grant is that if the qp is happy for it to go and doesn't feel that they've got to do anything more for it to to, to go out the door it can go to it doesn't have to have gone out the door but if you know other parts of the organization can now uh, can now get it going then that's the point at which it's able to be Goods on the market, placed on the market, and we're there. I think we're not yeah. going to we're not going to torture this one any further uh, because uh, uh, I, I, I think we've we're, we're slightly over time. But I, I want to to thank uh, thank you, Grant, particularly for agreeing to join us at short notice, Laura, for all the hard work that you've done, uh, uh, bumper attendance today uh, on the on the webinar. I hope you found it useful. Feedback is always welcome uh, for us. If I can just finish with the the standard. Um, requests that uh, uh, if you've enjoyed this, you'll probably enjoy the BIA MHRA conference uh, planned for uh, Thursday, the 5th of July at Euston Square. Uh, it's possible to register on the BIA website and no doubt we'll do more uh, of this uh, and uh, have uh, significant updates and engagement with the MHRA there. Um, I've already highlighted some of the uh, upcoming BIA events, but uh, you may also be interested in the BIA annual lecture and evening with David Cooksey at the Crick in London on May the 3rd, uh, the CEO Investor Forum, uh, 23rd, 24th of May, uh, Women in Biotech Networking Evening, uh, and the Summer Reception also coming up soon. If you have not joined us, uh, please consider it. Uh, membership is the lifeblood 
uh, of the BIA and uh, Jane would love to hear from you if you found this useful. Uh, as I say, the next web webinar briefing is Friday the 20th of April. Uh, we look forward to updating you further on this exciting development then. I hope you all have a good weekend and uh, this will be available on YouTube uh, for anybody who's not been able to catch it now, but will find it useful in the coming weeks. Many thanks. Goodbye.